everyone. Great to see you. My guest today is the great Jamie Baum, a wonderful flute player and composer and band leader. If you're unfamiliar with her music, please do yourself a favor and check out the links below. We had a great conversation. We talked about her body of work and her process and well, we touched on so many things. I really hope you enjoy. And if you do like the video, please um, like and subscribe and don't be afraid to reach out and say hello. Yeah, hope to see you next time. Your mother, she was a, she went to Juilliard in the pre-college. Pre-college. She lived in New Jersey and she played trombone and piano and mm -hmm. sang. As she tells me when she was in high school, she would take the train in and go to pre-college on Saturdays at Juilliard. And then also in those days, there was the radio shows, like the one she was on was called Major Bows, and they would have this, the, the big bands that would be coming through would come in and they would play and they would bring in like local singers to mm -hmm. sing with the big band. So my mom did that a bit. That's and amazing. Huh? That's really cool. It was yeah. it, it was a radio show. It was a radio show. That's really and, cool. Um, um, and then she went to Juilliard for a year. Mm -hmm. I think she was a double major or something. In, trombone, in trombone and like and classical piano. trombone. Yes. And she was. I mean, thinking... in those days they didn't have jazz yeah, programs right. anyway. Yeah. So she went for a year and then she married my dad, and of course in those days that was what you did. I couldn't imagine there's that many female trombone players. Yes, I mean, my mom Juilliard, is kind especially. of funny. She was always very self-effacing, which I think was part of that generation of women, mm -hmm. you know? So she always like, oh, I wasn't that talented, or blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you must have been to go there, yeah, you know right? what I mean? Especially as a woman, you yeah. know, I'm sure. But she, you know, so she didn't, she didn't really continue um, on the trombone. And she started playing it again, it's really funny, like maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I remember my husband and I came home to visit her one day and she was like, oh, I want to show you something. And she pulls out like one of those Jim Snydero play along records and she's like playing. I mean, she can't really improvise, but she was playing some of, you That's know, she knows really all cool. those tunes because yeah. all the, you know, Cole Porter, she knows all that stuff. You know, but she started us all on music when we were young. And so she started me on piano lessons when I was like three mm. or something. Having that kind of role model in your life seems so fitting because, you know, here you go to music school, being a jazz flute player and being probably one of the few females in the program. Very, I don't know, it's just, I can't help but notice the similarity between, you know, your mother's kind of path and, and your, your path also. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting, particularly now, and, and even when I went to Manhattan, because Manhattan School of Music used to be Juilliard. Oh, interesting. And, okay. the, and and they moved to Lincoln Center. So I went to the school that my mother went ah. to, and I've been teaching in the yeah, same you school. Teach now. Yeah, so, you know, I was telling you that I had studied classical piano, but study is really a misnomer because I never practiced. But when I was like 12 or 13, I ended up taking for a year with this guy, um, John Mahigan, who lived in my town. And one thing that stands out to me was they would take me into New York to hear music or hear shows and stuff. And one night we went, I can't remember if it was the five spot or the half note or something, but they took me in to hear Dizzy Gillespie. Wow. And we went, we drove in. And in those days it was like a lot cheaper to go into New York. You mm. know, now it's like crazy. But in those days they took me you know we went to a restaurant to eat and it was a really nice night i think it was in the summer or something and so um my dad and i wanted to walk but my mom didn't so she took a cab and when we arrived it was still early you know we arrived she was sitting at a table with dizzy gillespie telling him about her daughter that wanted to be a jazz piano player so he was so really nice and he went in the kitchen, brought me cookies and we were talking. Really? And then before he was about to play, he pulled out his card and on the back he wrote, he said, when, when you're ready, here's somebody to call that you should study with and tell him I sent you. Wow. So, you know, as I mentioned before, I kind of quit piano after that year. 
and you know, I the card, I, I never don't know what happened to it. And then about 10 years ago, or maybe longer, my parents were getting ready to move from their house, and I had to clean everything out. And I found like behind the drawer, you know, the card. And the back of the card was um, Lenny Tristano's name and phone number. <laughs> I don't wow. know who it could have been, you know. That is really so, incredible. Yeah, it's kind of a cool story. Hmm. You know, I quit piano and I decided that I wanted to play something that was more mobile that, you know, I could just have fun with. Because, mm -hmm. like I said, I never thought of myself as a musician. It was just something I enjoyed. You know, I played in the high school marching band. Like I said, I was probably like 40th flute, you know. And then I went, I graduated a year early and I ended up going to University of Vermont. I wanted to take flute lessons. There wasn't a music major. I was like political science, philosophy and different stuff. Mm -hmm. And I took flute lessons, but I met some other people that were, you know, playing sort of jazz, I, you know, and I would jam with them and they'd mm -hmm. have these coffee houses. And so they took me, um, since we were in Vermont, they, we used to go, they used to drive up to Montreal. So they took me to hear Hubert Laws one time and I met him and, you know, to hear other people, I got to hear Miles and different people and I just sort of started thinking that I wanted to do that. Wow. I, it wasn't like I knew I wanted to play jazz, only jazz, because I really enjoyed classical mm -hmm. and other stuff, but, and so at that point I, I sort of really realized that I was like, didn't have anything together. Okay. So I, I decided to take a year off and um, my parents were very generous. They helped me go live in Paris for a year. Wow. So I studied with you know some of the classical flute players. I took some classes there, like this guy, Michel de Bost, who is a yeah. very well-known classical. Yeah, I have his book. And, and then some with his wife who, and also um, this guy, Michel Aliroll, who was like in the Paris Symphony. Wow. So I was studying classical and I took some classes at some of the French schools, that, you know. Um, Paris Conservatory? No, um, no. That, you know, they have a really different system where you mm. you had to be, like you could, couldn't could be older than 17 to get in or oh, something. Oh, okay. So I took some classes at a place called La Scola Cantorum and then okay. Ecole Normale de Musique, which were these smaller schools. Okay. You know, do, do you speak French? Well, it's been a long time. <laughs> oh, but you, you, I, I spoke able fluent to. when I was there. Wow, okay. But it's been a long time. Yeah, sure. So, you know, a couple of glasses of wine, and I probably <laughs> could. You know. But um, yeah, so that was great. I met a lot of people that, you know, at that time there was a lot of world music there. Like I met some mm. Brazilian guitar player and some different people. And so I was, you know, always, I never. I sort of wasn't sure what direction I wanted to go in, but I knew I liked playing a lot of different kinds of music. Mm -hmm. And I also really enjoyed classical music. And at that time sort of envisioned, I didn't know what I envisioned, but I, I just knew that I needed to get, get it together if I wanted to go to a music school. So I, I applied to New England Conservatory in the third string program. I was very lucky. It was very interesting, you know, Ram Blake was running the program at the time. Mm -hmm. And audition was basically, you know, to play a piece. So I think I played Syrinx or something. And then he gave you a cassette, showing my age here, but he gave you a cassette of like six tunes, you know, like one I think was a Monk tune from Billie Holiday. One was his and one was, you know, I don't know, Greek piece or something. I don't know, but you had to go back to your hotel or wherever you were for like the weekend and learn to be able to sing them. And if you could come back and sing them, then... Whoa. So I was able to sing them, and that's kind of how I got in. And I think Ran is a very interesting guy. He was kind of intrigued that I had been playing all sorts of music in France. Yeah. So. so so, I was very lucky, and in a way, I think in, in, I embodied the third stream, you know, in my trajectory because even, you know, the idea was taking different influences and creating your own style. Mm -hmm. And at that time, like I was really into Coltrane and, and Stravinsky and, 
And I quickly learned that how could I possibly do something like that if I couldn't even play a blues or over changes. So I transferred out of that program into the jazz program. Okay. And so, and at that point I was still really behind I was like one of three women in the jazz program the whole time I was there. I also took outside of the school with this guy, Charlie Benakis, who was, you know, so I was doing that. And, and you know, of course, they didn't have a jazz flute teacher there, so I sort of split lessons, and I was taking some classical flute with this guy, Robert Stallman, and then I studied with Jackie Bard for the first two years. I really realized once I was there that I was not going to go in classical direction. And so I studied with Joe Allard and part time, and then I studied some with this uh, composer, Tom McKinley, and that's when I made a double major. So I was jazz wow, that's really jazz cool. composition. So if for you to f find your way, this circuitous Circuitous. Yeah. I turned the corner, and especially when I went to NEC. Mm. I mean, the first, really, when I went to NEC, that really shifted for me. Because, um, like I said, I, 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 I mean, I was so bad that when I got the acceptance letter, my parents made me call up to make it sure it wasn't a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, like the first six months, I was like. You know, I had such anxiety because everybody was so much better and being, you know, and there weren't any women there and mm -hmm. it was just very difficult. So I sort of came to a fork in the road and took it, you know, but it was sort of like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to have to lock myself in a practice room for the next 10 years, which is basically what I did. I was very lucky in that there were some people that were sort of really mentors or were really rooting supportive mm. of me and one was Jackie you know I think he kind of saw me as like such an outsider you know what I mean and mm. or appreciated that I appreciated what he was doing you know um, even though I in no way was able to really appreciate what he had to offer, the level that I was at. And then Charlie, same thing. I mean, if you talk to anybody who studied with Charlie, um, even though he had an amazing gift for breaking things down and being able to teach that, mm -hmm. most people would say it was his personality that they really loved. Like I studied with him on and off for about five years. And then when I moved to New York, like a lot of people would study with him through the mail. And I mean, that was a really big thing for a long time. And, and I just, to me, the whole thing was the connection with him. You know mm. what I mean? Another person who was very supportive of me and kind of really was encouraging was George Russell. Because oh. um, I, I took his class and I was in his small ensemble. And so he was very, you know, supportive. So, you know, I was, I was lucky. I've had some, it was really, you know, some teachers along the way that kind of were sort of encouraging to me. Yard, yard, yard by yard. yard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when did that ensemble take shape? Well, when I was studying with Jackie, I had tons of charts that, that I still sort mm. of carried around with me. I think it was like in 2009, I was at this party at Judy and Joe Lovanos, we we're, were good friends with them, and I ran into George, and I had just sort of been coming out of... This is George Schuler. George Schuler. Okay. And I was coming out of a really bad period because I had fractured my shoulder and torn my rotator oh, cuff, oh, and then I got frozen shoulder. So oh. it was really bad for, you know, it was kind of derailed for about six months. Yeah. But, um, and he had a, you know, broken, ankle or something so we're just sitting you know talking you know I said, okay you know we have to come up with something you know to... so we started talking oh we should really do something you know Jackie's music and get some of the guys together you know so that that's kind of how it came about it was kind of a cooperative thing mm -hmm. and me and George and and Jerome and Adam we did a recording and we did some tours and and it was cool it was just you know really nice to after all these years sort of go back and check out the music after s sort of growing a bit musically and being able to sort of really appreciate the jazz. You 
Did you go directly to Manhattan School of Music? Did you take some time off? I took a little bit of time off. I was really very lucky because my last year I was there. Um, I don't know if you ever met Jeff Williams, but he's a wonderful drummer. Right. Here. He was living in Boston at the time, and he had this amazing gig at this lounge that was part next to an Italian restaurant. We kind of thought maybe they were laundering money or something because it was this lounge. They made it a jazz lounge and nobody would ever go, but it, you know, he had like a, Jeff had a quartet gig, like I think it was three nights a week. And I remember he, as I was finishing New England, he called me up. We had become friends. I don't remember how we met, but he called me up and he said, I just got fired because they said it was too loud. So you should go down there right away and see if you can get the gig. So I went down there and I got the gig. So I had this steady gig wow. for one year, three nights a week. And I thought, you know, I'm still so behind the eight balls. It'd be a good opportunity. And the one thing that um, Jackie and Charlie and George all sort of, Russell all sort of really impressed upon me was that they all said to me, you're never gonna have the opportunities to get what you need in terms of feel, articulation, you know, all that stuff that if you played sax, you could play in a big band or you could get hired by other people, you know, go on the road or do mm -hmm. these other kind of things. So what you're gonna have to do is hire people better than you and pay them and learn from them. Wow. Okay. And that's what I did. And then we got fired and then they hired me back like a month later and they wanted me to bring up piano players from New York. I do not know why, but it was at this amazing time where, you know, like Fred Hirsch was starting to teach at NEC, and so he would often play with me. Oh and my then gosh. Kenny oh. Werner was sort of in between stuff that he was doing, and so he would come up. But Joe Hunt was my drummer, huh. and John Lockwood was the bass player, and so we had these piano players. and and um, Donald Brown was teaching there at, at Berkeley and James Williams. And so I was playing with, you That's know, incredible. all these guys. And then I started playing in Donald Brown's band. I so I did that. some gigs with him, wow. um, like this place called The Willow. So it was just a really incredible education for me. You know, I, I really learned a lot. I mean, I took to heart what Jackie and those guys told me. And you really learning. created your own opportunity. Though. I did, really, you know. And that's how you kind of moved to New York? Yeah, I sort of went back and forth for a while. I also, I did a lot of sublets, like I sublet Kenny's place, I sublet Ron McClure's place for mm. a while, and you know, so I did that, and then I finally moved down. Then you went to Manhattan and School then I went to for Manhattan School composition? For composition. Jazz, yes. Was it jazz, jazz composition? composition? And what was the impetus for, for getting a degree in jazz composition at the time? Um, it, it, it was sort of a couple of reasons. I mean, one, I was sort of struggling financially, you know mm. what I mean, to as a flute player still at that time, like trying to work, just kind of getting some familial pressure, you know, oh, to get an right. advanced degree from for teaching. Sure. Um, but at the same time, you know, I had my undergrad degree in composing and I always, you know, double and I always sort of wanted to do both. Mm -hmm. And it sort of seemed to me that it would make much more sense and be more valuable to me to go back to school for composition as opposed to jazz flute. I could have opportunities to compose and hear my stuff played and, you know, and maybe that would sort of offer some other options. Yeah, it sounds like you were still trying to uh, figure out a way to make your own opportunities. I found that if I wrote interesting, challenging music, that I could get really good players that wanted to play with mm. me. So that was another opportunity for me to be able to play with people better than me to learn and to get opportunity. And, and also, I was interested, like I said, in modern music, things that I wanted to get better at, like writing advanced things harmonically or things with odd meters or things like that. You know, it's not like you could find them in the real book. So to have something to practice with. At least it's interesting to me that transition of um, from student to, you know, being a freelancer, I guess. Yeah. What was that like? Um, well, one of the things that was 
interesting you might appreciate is that for my master's recital, Rich really wanted me to write for a larger group because when I was going to school there, I was still kind of working and playing. And I had usually used, played either quartet or quintet, always using trumpet and playing my own music. Mm -hmm. So he really encouraged me to go bigger. One of my goals was to find a way to make it seem important or worthy or valid for jazz, being not mm -hmm. just a double on a ballad or a bossa nova. Mm -hmm. That was part of my inspiration for starting the septet. But the other inspiration was I was had been doing a lot of wedding gigs, like classical wedding gigs with like great string players mm -hmm. and playing a lot of Bach. And and I, I loved that actually. I loved the counterpoint. I loved being an inner voice a lot. And I always kind of felt like when I would play a quartet situation or quintet that sometimes the rhythm section was having more fun than I was. I always felt like I was playing the melody and they would get into all this stuff. So I started thinking, oh, if I playing flute and alto flute, you know, sometimes I didn't want to be on the top voice. I wanted to be in a middle voice or, or take a different role. And so um, when I put the my septet together for my master's recital, I thought, well, if I use out, you know, alto sax and tenor and trombone or berry, the flute is going to seem so small. I thought, okay, I'll use French horn instead of trombone. I had met um, Doug Yates, and Doug played alto sax and bass clarinet. Mm. So I thought, oh, that would be really cool because then I could also bring in some of these classical influences, having the bass clarinet, the French horn, and the flute. The fact that I could use the alto and the trumpet and the French horn or sometimes I could use the bass clarinet and mm -hmm. alto flute and give me a lot of colors to work with. So that was sort of the genesis of the septet. Oh, that's and interesting. Oddly enough. Can you talk a little bit about at the time, were there any female jazz musicians that you looked up to or that you uh, mentored you in any way? When I was in school, there really, you know, there was a couple, there were, like Debbie Keefe who was um, married to Steve Johns, played okay. saxophone, and this other friend of mine, Cersei Miller. Um, and then, sort of toward the end, Rachel Nicolazzo or Rachel Z yeah. came. And um, But other than that, there really weren't any. Um, and when I moved to New York, there, there were a few that were sort of a little older than me, like mm. Jane Ira Bloom, who sort of I looked to. And I actually knew Terry Lynn from Boston, and I had played actually duo with her at a Boston Globe Jazz Festival. <laughs> that was a really long time ago. But I mean, there were some that I would, when I moved to New York, you know, I, I, I met and would play with like Cheryl Bailey and okay. Roberta Pickett and Virginia Mayhew. And in fact, we had an all women band. We were kind of ahead of the curve at that time around, I think it was around 2000, around that same time. Um, it was me and Roberta and Virginia and Allison Miller and Nikki Peratt. Wow, okay. So we had That's a, a group band. together for yeah. five years. We did one recording and some tours. Oh, cool. So that was really fun. You know, there, were, there weren't there were that many at the time. What advice would you give, I guess, a young female jazz player today? It's really different now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It, it's like night and day. While it still has ways to go, it's just night and day now. Because yeah. there are a lot of women. And the, the biggest problem for women of my generation was that we didn't, you know, as you know, as a musician, you know, the more you opportunities you have to play, the better you get. The less you play, it's kind of the opposite. You can practice, but it's harder to make strides or to keep it together. And so for me, the biggest issue was not having the opportunities. But I think, you know, when I look around at a lot of the younger women that are out there now, it, I think that, I'm not saying they have, it's like, hugely easy, but I think that they had a lot more opportunities in high school bands. When I was that age, we didn't have all these jazz camps and all these jazz right, right. aids, and, and certainly there were no hip band directors in high school that would include flute. They would be like, oh, we don't have 
flute chair, you know, which is kind of a big problem even now. A lot of them aren't at the same level to get into a lot of these programs. So I think, you know, you look around and, and, and there's a lot more opportunities and it's much more um, accepted, especially with the younger guys. They're used to having girls in their bands and so it's not such a weird thing. Musically, you know, you look around you see people on all these different instruments that are doing amazing things. I think it's just, and, and styles of music and inclusivity in terms of different world music. So, I mean, I think all that is just so different now. In, in my opinion, I think having all of it is the, the ultimate thing. Because I, I honestly, my feeling has always been the thing that's really the beauty of jazz and the people that I've always been inspired by have always moved the music forward. I mean, it's this septet plus, you started it in grad school. Can you, you want to talk a little <laughs> bit about that? Sure. It's kind of funny because there have been many times where I thought I was not going to continue it mm. because because I loved I do love to play I just like I'd be really bored doing one thing but I've thought about stopping the septet many times <laughs> this is such an expense and it's really hard to it's hard to tour with that many people and people get busy and you're booking like seven full eight flights eight rooms mm -hmm. it's insane and it's also so time consuming, which I, a lot of times afterwards, I think, oh, I could have been writing or practicing. So it's a little bit frustrating. And that's why I say, you know, being famous or rich, because then you have somebody else do that for you. <laughs> <laughs> that's the part that yeah. I, that's the part that I want. But um, it's kind of funny because it's this like cyclic thing where the way I would get people to rehearse for a gig was if I had new music because if I didn't have new music they'd be like well, we don't need a rehearsal but we do need a rehearsal because we haven't played in six months you know <laughs> what I mean you know there's a new person yeah. and sub and I need a rehearsal for that yeah, sub yeah. you know so I'd have to write some new music and, and then you... I'd have new music and then I'd be like well I really want to record this new music <laughs> so then I'd be like okay I'm going to record it and then I'm going to stop <laughs> but then like the recording comes out and you figure you might as well do some gigs to support the recording and yeah you know, and it just and keeps going it just keeps going you know yeah, yeah. do you have um like a book you write ideas in? Do you block out time every day and sit at the, do you write it? Like, what does it look like? I wish that I had the time that I could write every day. Cause I, when I, when I do that, I, I'm, I feel pretty happy. But I really make my living from playing all these years. So I have to keep that together. You know what I mean? And I find that, I find that I'm almost more drawn to writing in a way, and so when I start it, it's like I, the, my playing goes out the window. I can really get lost in it, like mm. I can, where I don't find that happens that often with practicing. I can just spend like hours on two measures and and forget about everything, and and you know it's kind of like a puzzle. I really I really love doing it. When I was in school, it was great because I had lessons every week, and so I had to write every day. I've been lucky I've found to go to some of these artist colonies, which is really a gift to just go and have a grand piano because I have like a DX7 in my right. apartment. Um, one thing that I do is I have a um, writing program. I have um, Digital Performer, which is a sequencing program actually. Oh, and that's been a godsend, which I've used for several years now because I, while I have minimal piano chops, um, you know, particularly writing for so many instruments, and it's like I can't hear things in real time. And so writing them, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll noodle around on the piano and come up with ideas, and I'll try things, and I'll work on my ideas really in the piano, and then I'll transfer them to um, the sequencing program. Hmm. And I, I put them in, I don't even put them in from the piano. My piano playing is so bad, I just, 
put in each note. Okay. And but the wonderful thing about it is is that I can move things around really easily. Hmm. And I, I think I find that really important because, you know, it's like one thing if you're writing something with a familiar form, like if you're writing a 32 bar tune or something, there's not much you have to worry about. But when you're writing something that's somewhat through composed, except maybe for the improvisation sections or you have these different ideas, one of the things that I find the most challenging is this, I don't know how to put this, but the spatial relationship. So, like, for example, you know, you have an idea and and uh, does it need a rest or does it need um, three bars in between? Should it repeat? Should Is it long enough before the next section comes in? Um, is it, you know, is it sound in the right key or does it, does it you know, make sense to where these other voices are coming in? Um, is, is it getting buried or, or, you know, so a lot of things, you know, I'll start to write and then, you know, like I do a lot of singing in the shower over and over again, or I'll sit back and I'll listen to what I've done so far, maybe 50 times in a row, you know, in, until I hear what should happen next. For as much schooling as I've had, I'm a very intuitive composer, really. I don't plan things out and I don't structure things very often. It's it, my skills that I've learned really come in after the fact and how to maybe s visualize or Polish see what needs or to happen or what maybe, you know, I can look at something and think, oh, I, you know, I can even just see all, of, all the phrases are starting in the same place. It'll be much more interesting if I move that or hear things and, you know, just trying to have it be more organic by really hearing, you know, because at this point I've been doing it so long, I kind of really trust my instincts more. What are you practicing, or what do you like work on daily? In the in terms of my flute, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, flute is a weird instrument. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I say that because I really feel like it's very similar to the trumpet, much more similar to the trumpet in terms of embouchure than to the saxophone or the mm -hmm. clarinet. And so if you have friends that are trumpet players, you know that they are like beholden to that instrument, you know, mm -hmm. it's like the monkey on the back, you know, it's like you have to practice it every day and a lot of time is spent on technique, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I feel like that with the flute. I thought it's these muscles, like you just have to make these muscles work every day. Is that what you're meaning? Yeah, by that? Um, absolutely. I mean, I feel like what you're saying is very true and it, it feel like the muscles here and here to get in touch with what needs to happen because it's the concept is creating the smallest hole possible that still is supple and flexible you know so the this little area where the air comes out if it's really tight you know it's going to be a very choked sound and you can't really move your embouchure around what you need to do to get the different registers on the flute. Mm -hmm. The flute is different. I mean, you got to get the air out of your mouth and hit in the right spot. So there's some movement going on. So if it's just too tight, you can't do that either. So it's this very um, specific thing that has to happen where, you know, there's a lot of support and the, but the smallest hole possible to create a really strong air stream. Mm -hmm. So I probably spend a lot of time on sound and technique um like do you do you still do the moise exercises or do you do your own like version that. Of, i do my own versions yeah. you know but probably really similar like trevor y has some things that i like and you know i try to vary it up a little but i'm not very good at doing that but you know it's always long tones it's always mm. um scales and arpeggios and different kinds of tonguing yeah you know and um and then of course you know improvising playing over tunes or maybe solos or you know different ways of of or taking things and putting them in different keys but still being cognizant of the sound and you know that kind of thing mm -hmm. so um or and then there's always like learning music learning somebody's music you know somebody's project that i'm working on or or my own and and so the time seems to go by quickly would you care to play a tune with me sure you want to try that uh the bach sure piece? Thank you. 
had just been to VCCA, which is Virginia Center for the Contemporary Center for the Arts, which is a, a sort of like McDowell, it's like a colony. I saw this th website, Bill Moyers. Have you ever heard of Bill Moyers? Yeah. I just always loved him. Somebody posted something, maybe on Facebook or something, and it directed me to a website that he had created, and it was called um, A Poet a Day, The Right Words for the Right Time. And it was amazing. He posted every day a poet and it would be a poem that would be pandemic related and it would be somebody that he had interviewed in the past so he would post the poet reading a video of the poem poet oh. reading that poem in addition to being able to read it. Mm. I was never a big poetry person until when I went to McDowell several years ago and McDowell's such an amazing place, you know, this artist colony and they, you would work it during the day and some nights people, you know, will present their work. So they had like a couple of these like Pulitzer Prize winning poet, poets there and they read their work and it was just, blew my mind. It was like hearing them read it. It was like suddenly I sort of got into it. Mm. Anyway, I just started thinking, well, you know, what have I not done before? The first two recordings I did with the septet were sort of classically influenced. Mm -hmm. And then I switched to the more South Asian from having done tours and playing a lot mm. of that music and being inspired by that. And sort of, I guess, okay, well, I'm not South Asian and I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to go to Indian study, so maybe it's time for something else, you know. So um, the thing I realized that I had never done was I never wrote with lyrics or for vocals mm -hmm. or for using poetry or anything. So I thought, okay, well, now's a good time. I was very inspired and I decided to take women poets such as um, Adrienne Rich, I don't know if you're mm -hmm. familiar with her, but she has some great poetry and Marge Piercy and um, Tracy K. Smith and a few other poets. You know, really understanding the range, you know, you're working with somebody's range and where they can best sing certain types of lyrics and express certain types of things. Mm -hmm. Suddenly there's this whole other skill set and mm -hmm. understanding of that and understanding of the voice and how that works and 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 truthfully um the first piece i wrote um you know i i was able to get this wonderful vocalist i don't know if you know aubrey johnson oh yeah of course you know she like can do anything and so she really enjoyed the challenge of singing some of it mm -hmm. and Sort of the more that I hear it, the more I feel like it's not working. Okay. It has nothing to do with her because she's doing it amazingly. Mm. So I'm learning, yeah. you know. You're kind of in the thick of it, trying to I'm figure this, it. Fig figure it out. Yeah. There's two pieces the book ending the project, which are do not have voice. I mean, you, you, you played on one of them, the one with all the singing bowls, the very first oh, one right. was like mm -hmm. really crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote, uh, one similar to that that's different but okay. similar using some of the themes at the end okay um, but the rest are with vocal and oh, um, cool. and I'm working I have two more like I'm in the middle of the second to last one I have two more that I'm that I'm that I want to finish before we you know I record the projects you know trying what, to and different you, styles when are you plan to I'm record? hoping to do it in April oh wow yeah cool yeah. So. Well, I look forward to hearing it. <laughs> yeah. Can I, can I ask you to play one more? Yep, sure. Um, this is actually entitled Song Without Words, I think. Yes. And I have you to get out tell me, Alta this is Fruit. one of your compositions. Do you want to speak about it for a yeah, second? Yeah, I wrote when I went to McDowell, um, which is just like a God's gift from heaven, really. It's just, if. Have you been? No. You should uh -uh. go. It's just amazing. It's It was like probably the first artist colony in the United States. And I think they built it like in 1901 or something. Mm. And um, it, it, it it's basically on 500 acres in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And they give you like your own 
usually one or two room cabin, you know, and if, you know, all different arts, like the photographers of the photography cabin, you know, and so there's just like four or five composers and you have a grand piano and, wow. you know, and, and it's just like you're in the woods and you just can write at four in the morning if you want or mm -hmm. all day and not, nobody bothers you, you know, so. Anyway, I had went there, I wrote this in 2014, and I, I, my dad had passed away about six months before that, and it was like th two weeks before my CD came out, and we had like CD mm. release gig, and so I was just like so busy, I didn't really have time to sort of really process it, and then there I was like in the woods by myself, you know, writing, mm. and so it just kind of like came out, and the inspiration is kind of interesting because I don't know if you're familiar with Yom Kippur. They always have like a cello. Um, Yom Kippur is like the highest holiday in Jewish religion. Not that I'm super religious. Anyway, on Yom Kippur, which is the highest holiday, I would often go with my parents, even though I, you know, because I really enjoyed it. They always would have a cello playing Kol Nidre, which is, um, it's this piece of music that was actually written, I think, by Bruch, who was, I don't believe was Jewish, but they use this song. And it's really beautiful. But I remember um, wanting to use that kind of as an inspiration as a very mournful, you know, piece. And when I came back from writing this at, at um, McDowell, I, I was watching PBS and for some reason they had this show on about Kol Nidre um, and they had gathered all these rabbis from all over the world to, to talk about this piece that is just played all over the world and um, I guess the story goes that um, during the Second World War and the Holocaust the Jews on the highest holiday uh, they wanted to sing you know the songs and then chant the prayers and I guess I can't remember exactly what happened but the police or the whatever they would come in and they would tell them that they could either sing the songs or they could chant the prayers but they couldn't do both and it was a very strange thing and so then there was this big discussion of whether the singing songs was more direct line to God or chanting and they decided that the songs without words was mm. more direct line. So oh, I like that beautiful. title. Love so. that.
say before I, thanks for coming oh, by. It's really you. wonderful to talk to. to you. Well, that was it. I hope you enjoyed that. Again, please like and subscribe if you liked this video. It would mean the world to me. Hope you're well, and I will see you next time.